Hi, this is Mark from ITCU Solutions, and today I'd just like to go over how to route between VRFs and your global routing table if you only have a single device or router. And today we're just going to use a, a cheap Cisco router, a Cisco 887, to demonstrate this. This router just has four VLAN interfaces, physical interfaces. I've already set those up, as you can see, over in my config on the side over here. Um, but what we're going to do is we need to set up uh, tunnels in order to route across this. I can't just bleed routes using B BGP, leak routes using BGP or something along those lines because there's actually no physical, since we only have one device, there's no physical interface in order to uh, target our routes to. So in our case, we're just going to create a couple uh, logical tunnel interfaces and this will give us targets to route our routes between the VRF routing tables and the global routing tables. So in our example over here, to do this, I'm going to create four loopback interfaces. And you'll notice all the loopback interfaces are in the global routing table. This has to be done because the source and destination of GRE tunnels have to be located in a routing table where they can see each other. Uh, if one of these loopbacks was in one of the VRFs, they wouldn't be able to see each other, so they wouldn't, they'd have no way to establish the tunnel. However, the reason this works is that the, one of the tunnel interfaces one end of the tunnel is located in the VRF, which then that tunnel interface can be used as my target in my routes. And in this example today, we'll just set up static routes to demonstrate how this works. But you could use dynamic routes or whatever you want to do in your lab setup to get this to work. Um, so let's get started. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to set up a couple VRFs. So let's do that real quick. And we're just going to call it VRF1. And for our route descriptor, I don't really care because this is just a lab setup, so I'm just going to call it 21. I'm not going to be leaking any routes uh, with BGP or anything like that. If you are doing that, generally when you set up your route descriptors, uh, you probably want to use like your BGP autonomous system numbers or something along those lines. Okay, so we have our VRFs created, VRF1 and 2. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to create all four of these loopback interfaces in the global routing table. So I'm just going to create interface loopback. Shoot. Loopback 2. And the IP address on the drawing is 2221. Okay. Then we'll cr create loopback 3. Then we'll create loopback 4. And again, all of these um, loopback interfaces that are involved in the same tunnel have to be in the same routing table so they can see each other. And then we'll create loopback 5. Okay. Now uh, the next step is we have all these loopbacks created, so I'm going to create these tunnel interfaces. So I'll create the first one, tunnel one. And let's see, he's going to be in our, I'm going to throw a description on here because he's going to be in VRF1, so I can keep them straight. Bandwidth doesn't really matter for this example, but I'm going to throw it in there anyways. And I'm going to add it to my VRF with the IP VRF forwarding statement. Whoop. And he's going to be in VRF1. Let's just call it 51.1. Okay. Let's see. And here's the important part of the uh, tunnel, the tunnel source. So since we're using tunnel one, um, we're going to make the source loop back two. And 
the destination will be the other end of the tunnel in our over here. It's going to be loopback three. And you have to put the IP in on the destination. Okay, so we're done with tunnel one. And I'm going to set up tunnel two, the other end of that tunnel. And he's going to be in the global table. And I'm just putting this description here so I can keep them straight. So he won't have a VRF statement. We'll make him dot two, the other side. And of course, his sources will be flipped around the mirror of the uh, other end of the tunnel. So his source will become loopback three. And the tunnel destination will now be. 2.2.1 okay so we have built this GRE tunnel right here so I'm going to do the same thing for the next for tunnel 3 oops and he's going to be in VRF2 so I'm just going to grab this description up here Since he's a separate tunnel, he can't be using this shared subnet. So we'll change that. And his source will now be loopback 4, as you see in the diagram over here. Oops. And his destination will be loopback 5, whose address is 5.5.1. And so we just need to build the other end of that tunnel. So it's going to be tunnel four. Okay. Let's call him global again. Oops. He's going to be in the global routing table. He'll be in the other side of that subnet. And let's see what else do we need. So his source is going to be loopback five. And his destination will be loopback four. So we'll have both tunnels completely built. Now you could probably instead of creating two completely separate using four different loopbacks here. You probably could use one loopback and use MGRE. Um, so you just have one tunnel point in your global routing table. But you'd have to use the mapping with the next top routing protocol. And for what we're doing, I think this is just a simpler way to do it. If you had a ton of VRF, so that might be the way you want to set it up. So, okay, so we have our tunnels all built. The VLANs are here. We have our VRFs, and <coughs> we utilize all of our loopbacks. So if everything's working, working, those tunnel interfaces should be up now. So we'll check that real quick. And as you can see, it's up. Tunnel 1 is up right here. That's what I was looking for. Tunnel 2 should be up because Tunnel 1 was up. And Tunnel 3 is up. Tunnel 4 is up. And also, <coughs> if the tunnel is working properly, I should be able to ping the other end, the endpoint in the VRF, since I'm in my global routing table. So I'm going to see if I can ping this uh, tunnel interface. It's in VRF 1, and I can. And I'm going to do the same thing for the one in VRF 2. This is a good sign. This is telling you that you're tunnel is able to route traffic across there. Now, <coughs> I can't ping anything, so if I try to ping uh, VLAN 4, for example, it's not going to work because I don't have any routes in place right now, which is the next step to this. As you can see this... Oh, wait a second. I might not, I might not have my VLANs in the VRFs. So let's do that real quick. 
I, of course I don't because I just created the VRFs. So let's add the VLANs to the VRFs. So we're going to have, whoops, not VLAN 4. VLAN 4 is going to be in, he's in VRF 1, so he should be in the same VRF as Tunnel 1. And uh, then, of course, we have to add the IP back in. Okay, so then we also need to do the same thing for v VLAN 5. Let's add him to VRF 2. which should be the same as Tunnel 3 in the diagram. And we have to add his IP back on as well. Okay. So I shouldn't be able to ping across that. You can see I don't because I don't have a route. So the next step that we need to do here is add the routes so we can figure out how to route across uh, these things. So the first route, I just tried to ping over to VRF1. <coughs> And I have to use the target, so since I'm doing my, the route in the global routing table, I have to route to the tunnel interface that's in my global routing table. So to get to 172.31.5.65, I have to direct it towards tunnel 2. So let's, let's do that. We'll create an IP route for that. I guess I could have did a host route, but okay. So that should be a route from the global to VRF1, and I'm going to do the same thing for uh, the 10992 network that's in VRF2. So let's do that real quick. So we're going to do 10. Is it 9.92? Oh, so we'll just I'll this we'll use a class C and we'll send that to tunnel 4 because again that's my tunnel that's in the global routing table that will get me here through through to this to the tunnel interface up here so we now have the route from the global routing table to the VRFs but if we try to ping it it still won't work because the VRF itself will need a route back so for VRF 1 the IP route VRF. So to get to something, so we'll use this 10.8.8.2 uh, interface for this test. I could use 1.1.1.2, one, 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 but I'm going to use 10.8.8.2 because I know that interface is up. So let's see, we have IP route VRF, so we're going to do VRF1 and 10.8.8.0. Class C. And since we're coming from VRF1, we have to use Tunnel 1 as our target, because that's the tunnel interface that's actually in the VRF. And then we'll do the same thing for VRF2 to route to that network. So this route should basically look the same. Except, of course, this time we're going to go to Tunnel 3. Okay. <clears throat> so now when I go to ping, it works fine, and I should also be able to ping Oh shoot, is that even the right IP? Yeah, night. Oh, I have the wrong IP address. <laughs> it's like I goofed up something, but it looks like it might just be the IP. Okay, so now I'm routing across if I try to route back from the VRF itself, so if we do ping VRF, um, VRF1, and we ping to something, the 10A2 address, oh, it works, and the same thing should happen if we ping, so you can see our, uh, we can, ping and route between VRFs on a single router. You can use whatever dynamic protocol that you want doing this. You can set up BGP if you want. Um, I just find this is a simple way, if I only have one device, uh, to set these types to get my lab working properly 
and it functions well. I can keep my clients separate and whenever I need like a connection to the internet, I can just build a tunnel. I hope this helps some of you guys, especially anyone that's starting out and wants to use, has a limited amount of equipment and would like to get a Cisco lab up and running. I hope everyone has a great day.